Hi there, friends. As you can see, I'm just here within um, a part of this community. And there's a lovely little creek here. And I'm just uh, standing on top of a uh, bridge just so people could cross from that point to this point. So we, uh, we are now in our study today of the, one of the most miraculous uh, events uh, recorded in Bible history. And as part of the Mysteries of the Bible series, we would like to look at this, uh, what I've entitled today, the Red Sea Detour. See, for many years, scholars have um, debated over what path or what, uh, what path of uh, uh, the, the Hebrew people took out of Egypt and exactly what body of water opened up for them to walk through before drowning a great Egyptian army. Uh, in Hebrew, the word Yamsuf is used to describe the body of water they crossed. Uh, the word yam means water um, or, uh, and, or sea, and surf is commonly translated as reeds, R-E-E-D-S. Um, so you might think, is it the Red Sea or is it the Reed Sea that they crossed on? Uh, consequently, some believe that instead of crossing the Red Sea, the Hebrew people actually took a more northerly route uh, that brought them to the shore of the Reed Sea, a more shallow lake known uh, for its abundant reeds. In this case, the Israelites would now have been able to wade through the shallow waters um, while the Egyptian chariots were stuck in the muddy lake bottom. In other biblical references, friends, Yam Suf actually means Red Sea or refers to one of its gulfs. Scholars determined that the Israelites traveled through the canyons of the Sinai Peninsula and came out the other end at a beach, possibly today's Noelba Beach in Egypt, on the edge of the Gulf of Aqaba an arm of the Red Sea. The same sea is also mentioned later on in the Israelites' journey, and these scholars say the Red Sea is the only body of water with a long enough coast to still be around later in their travels. Um, friends, it's, it's uh, very interesting that people are still wondering what really happened on that uh, fateful morning where the, the Egyptian army were right on the trails of the Israelites who camped just by the beach or just by the shores of the Red Sea. The night before, uh, Moses was commanded by God to start raising his hand so that the strong winds from the east actually blew over the Red Sea's waters. And by morning, the, the waters would have already been lifted up so that it would create this path of dry land that the Israelite people could travel on. Friends, we could believe the scientists, we could believe the archaeologists, there's even a story where they could see um, fossilized uh, parts of chariot wheels that were embedded on a certain part of the Red Sea. And they say that for thousands of years, they were the actual proof that somehow some, some chariots, an army of chariots, were drowned and were fossilized over the years. Friends, 
today we will look at an insightful view of what it took for Moses and Israelite people. With this escape through the Red Sea, God creates a miraculous path for the Israelites to evade the Egyptian army. Uh, to summarize the story, the Israelites fled Egypt with their newfound freedom. And God was eager to continue to prove his might and power, not only to his own people, but also to those who did not believe in him. In fact, he performed incredible wonders, uh, starting with the ten plagues and continuing on through their escape to show his power over the earth. Soon after Pharaoh granted the Israelites um, their freedom, if you may remember, God made his heart stubborn once more. So Pharaoh changed his mind and led an army of foot soldiers and 600 of his best chariots in a pursuit mission. He was determined, friends, to continue his defiance to God by reversing the freedom he granted them and uh, bringing them all back, the Hebrew people, back to Egypt. See, the, the Egyptian army quickly caught up to where the Israelites had set up camp by the sea. And um, the Israelites realized the predicament that they were caught in the middle of a crazed Egyptian army on one side and the sea on the other. It's like being stuck between a, a rock and a hard place. Uh, much like all of us today, uh, I see this uh, story of the Red Sea crossing as something that we all could relate to, even during, during these pandemic times. You might see yourself as um, uh, having plans, but then God has other plans. And so, as like um, driving uh, on the road, all of a sudden you see this bright orange signs and a blockade that says detour. Uh, many times we have detours, not just on the road, but also in life. And so sometimes we don't know on a detour road where we're headed, how long we're going to be on that road. Uh, so it creates um, feelings of anxiety, feelings of uh, worry and questions in your mind. And maybe today you are in that position, you are in that situation where you don't know where to go. You are stuck. You are like the Israelite people. Uh, and having uh, an army behind you and the Red Sea before you. But friends, see, even before this happened, God led the Israelite people from a place where they could have just crossed the Mediterranean Sea and uh, the Mediterranean path uh, towards the Promised Land, Canaan. Instead, God led them through a detour. He led them south where they would be encamping by the Red Sea. And this is where we're at. And friends, uh, I would like to first share with you today some interesting points on why God allows detours in our lives. Maybe I would call it today a divine detour. Something that God initiated. Something that God allowed for um, things to happen in our lives. Much like how the Hebrew people uh, have journeyed through the wilderness. Instead of going through what we call the, uh, a very interesting portion of, um, of the land between Egypt and Canaan called the, the Via Maris or the fastest way or the way of the sea. Um, sometimes God allows us to go through a route that is not the direct route. Sometimes um, he allows us to uh, not go the fastest way possible, but to go through the best way possible. And not only that, but sometimes God's route is not even the desired route. And we can see that when the, the Israelites went through the wilderness. Uh, in verse in chapter 13 of Exodus 
we read in verse 17. When Pharaoh, when Pharaoh let the people go, it says there, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. For God said, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by the desert road toward the Red Sea. Dear friends, sometimes not only do we know that God's route is not always the direct route, or God's route is not uh, the desired route for us. That's because we go through some desert, some wilderness experiences in our lives. Um, it is not desirable. It's not something that we plan to do. Uh, but God, in His almighty wisdom, in His uh, foreknowledge, has allowed for us to do. Maybe for a reason. And um, a third uh, interesting point in this is that uh, how we know that there's uh, God is leading us through a divine detour is that when God's route is not the discernible route, when God's route is not the discernible route, it says there, then God said to Moses, verse 2, tell the Israelites to turn back and encamp near uh, P. Haritoth, between Migdol and the sea. They are to encamp by the sea directly opposite Baal Shaphon. Pharaoh will think, the Israelites are wandering around the land in confusion, hemmed in by the desert. In verse 5, chapter 13, it says, When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds about them and said, What have we done? We have let the Israelites go and have lost their services. So, he had his chariot made ready and took his army with him. And so goes that the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh once again. So that in this instance, we see that um, they were pursued by the Egyptian army. What is pursuing you today? What is that something that is causing you pain, causing you anxiety in your life right now? Is it the uncertainty of the times? Is it the negativity that all is going on around us? If you read the news, if you, um, uh, if you have experienced unemployment, uh, if you have experienced a financial crisis or relational crisis because of this pandemic, maybe you're also in that part where um, something is pursuing you. It could also be sin, something that has been with you for a while. And you haven't fully surrendered to God. See, um, the Egyptians were pursuing the Israelites. And it says there that they, they overtook them as they camped by the sea near uh, Pi Hirothoth, opposite Baal Zephon. See, this route is not something they expected. Maybe you have other plans. Maybe you've had plans of, um, of graduating this year. And all these um, friends of yours and loved ones just celebrating with you. Maybe you had plans of celebrating a debut or um, a, a very significant milestone birthday. And you were planning a, for a big uh, social gathering. But it all went to naught because uh, social distancing happened. And uh, government regulations happened. Maybe... You were uh, planning to go on a mission trip. Maybe you were uh, planning to go uh, to visit family uh, abroad, but it never happened. See, we can't make sense of the detours in life. And our plans may have been thwarted by, by uh, this pandemic. And we could have either a right response or a wrong response to these divine detours that God allows for us to experience. I will observe here at least three. Let's go first to the three wrong responses to divine detours. Number one, uh, one negative or wrong response to a divine detour is panic. Panic. In verse 10, it says there, uh, As Pharaoh approached the Israelites, looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. See, 
the word terrify here, that's something that we probably haven't been using for a while, but it's really panic. It's something that uh, occurs in our minds, in our brains. Uh, sometimes um, uh, they are valid, sometimes they're not. Sometimes it's just like a, a mist or a big thick fog uh, in the morning where um, you cannot see anything. It's dark. Uh, it's zero visibility. But then if you just accumulate all those mist, all those fog around you and put it in a small container, you'll find out it's just droplets of water. It's really nothing. It's just something that allows for our brain, our minds to dwell on unnecessarily. And so panic is, um, is something that we, we have as a feeling of like a fear. Sometimes friends, just like the Israelite people, we allow our fears to overwhelm our faith. And that is something that God is not pleased with. Let us not allow our fears, even during these uncertain times, to overwhelm our faith. The faith that God has given us. The faith that comes from the Holy Spirit. Faith is a gift. And we have to open up ourselves up to receive this gift. Each and every day, ask God, Lord, give me the faith. Give me the strength and the courage to trust you in spite of the many things that we see around us that would overwhelm us. And so that's one wrong response, panic. Another wrong response is faithless prayer. And we can see that in the later part of verse 10. It says there, they were terrified and they cried out to the Lord. And you might say, well, wait, uh, what are you uh, talking about, Pastor? This is something that's actually good, right? It's a good response. You're terrified, and so you cry out in prayer to the Lord. That's what the Israelites did. But we can see in the second verse, in the, the verse following that, that that is not just what they did. It was actually faithless prayer. You know why? They said, they said to Moses in verse 11, Was it because they were, there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? You see, immediately after they prayed and they called out to God, they complained. They said, Is it because, Moses, that you there were not enough graves in Egypt? There was not a big enough cemetery for us, for all of our bodies to be uh, put in so that you took us out of the land of Egypt? And they were saying things like, you know, they actually liked it there. They, don't, they didn't like it there. They were dreaming for their freedom. They wanted, they were waiting for God to free them from the slavery in Egypt. But this is what happens, friends, when we are caught in, uh, caught in a corner and, um, and we don't know what to do. So panic sets in. We pray, yes, but then we don't believe our prayers. We don't believe that God would actually pull through. A third wrong response is blame. So panic, but also faithless prayer. But this is one thing that we're, most of us are guilty of, blame. Why? Verse 11 again, it says, uh, What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? The Hebrew people said to Moses, Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone? Let us serve the Egyptians? I, it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. See, after that, um, um, the faithless prayers that they had, after being surrounded by fear, it led to blame. It led to pointing fingers. It led to, you know what, I'm not responsible for this. He is responsible for this. Those, those people are responsible Everyone is responsible except you. And you put the blame on others as if you have no part in your situation. Friends, I hope these three wrong responses is not what we are, uh, that what we do whenever we're caught in a corner. 
And God allows divine leaders in our lives because He wants us to learn from Him. He wants us to eventually have the right response. So I can see here three right responses to divine leaders. First is we respond with confidence. We respond with confidence. We expect God to come through. Uh, in verse 13, it says, Moses answered the people, Do not be afraid. Stand firm, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. Is that comforting words? Those are encouraging words for us today. Whenever we read and open God's word, it encourages us. That's why I'm wondering, how come we don't read and study and meditate on God's word more often? Because if we truly have... Um, uh, this confidence in God's uh, wisdom, in God's will for us, then we will not be blaming others. We will not have faithless prayers. We will not be panicking. So one right response is respond with confidence. We expect God to come through. But also we respond with restraint. We're not allowing our minds to run wild. So in, in it says in the Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. That's Moses telling this, uh, this Israelite people. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Friends, if you look at this small body of water, it's very it's still waters. And um, I remember that psalm that says, um, uh, in spite of the many trials, tribulations that we're experiencing, we are only encouraged by the psalmist to be still and know that he is God. Be still. Just rest in the fact, rest in the confidence that you know you are serving the one true God. You are serving God who is uh, all-powerful, almighty, uh, full of wisdom and truth and justice. So we don't allow our minds to run wild. We, experience, we practice uh, restraint with our minds and not let uh, our minds go too far ahead, but instead enjoy the moment. Enjoy the moment with God. Enjoy your quiet times with God. When was the last time you actually had a quiet time? A time where you just enjoy the presence of God in your life. In Philippians 4, 6, it says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. That's why prayer is important, friends. Individual prayer, family prayer, group prayer, church prayer. Anything we could have the experience of actually praying, kneeling to God, and asking him for his intervention. God loves that. But the one third and final um, response, positive response that we can see in this uh, divine detours that God allows us to experience is we respond with obedience. We obey. We keep following instructions. We don't give up obeying him. We keep on obeying him. Why? Because we know that something good will happen. Verse 15 says, The Lord said to Moses, Why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divine the water so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them. And I will gain glory through Pharaoh and all his army, through his chariots and his horsemen. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. When I gain glory through Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. Friends, no big an army, no army of darkness and evil can run past the army of God. We are his armies. We are in a battle each and every day. But then we keep following the instructions of our commanding officer. Question is this. Are you reading, meditating, on God's word enough and so that you know his instructions for you each and every day when was the last time you actually sat down to hear his instructions hear his commands and obey them 
Obedience is the key. It's not just head knowledge, friends. And so, finally, we know how we can positively respond to divine detours. But then, the question ultimately is this. How does God use detours in our lives? How does God use situations in our lives where even though we are being detoured to a different location, different direction, and we know that God is accomplishing His purpose for us. First is, I think, God knows. God knows we're not ready yet for a challenge. Um, I read a while ago in verse 17, it says, For God said, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. See, God knows our minds. So God knows us enough. So that He knows that maybe sometimes we are not up for a challenge yet. So God let the people around the desert toward the Red Sea. Sometimes God allows us through the deserts of our lives onto the Red Sea, facing the sea and behind us an army. And so we only do what is right, and that is we turn to God in faith. And so friends, my encouragement is that if you have a plan that's being derailed, if you have a prayer that's still unanswered, trust Him. Trust Him that He knows that He will not give us a trial that we cannot bear. And He will take us out of that darkness into His wonderful light. Secondly, God displays His glory. How was God glorified in this? In, verse, in ch verses, uh, chapter 14, verse 4, it says, I will harden the Pharaoh's heart and he will pursue them, but I will gain glory for myself through the Pharaoh and his armies. And the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. Friends, all around us, there's unbelievers. There are unbelievers who either mock God or they don't acknowledge God. In all these debates politically, you know, we, we could see the, the logic in, every, in uh, the party's arguments. But little do we hear the mention of God's name. And it's sad because we know as people of God, as His own chosen people, that in everything, God is involved. He allows detours in our lives and He's sovereign. He's in control, friends. He's in control. And so God will display His glory his, for His purposes. His purpose for us is for, for us to be used by Him so that the gospel may be spread and His kingdom may be, continue to be ushered in. Finally, friends, I think it's the most important, most personal for me. God allows these detours in our lives. Why? Because He wants us to deepen our faith. He wants us to deepen our faith in Him. In verse 31, it says, When the Israelites saw the mighty hand of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord. The people feared the Lord and put their trust in Him and in Moses' servant. Friends, we have church leaders today who are doing their best to lead us through the Red Sea. Moses did his best, but then the people decided not to trust God through his servant. My encouragement today is that we continue to support and pray for our leaders. We need more Moseses in our church, in our faith community. And allow them to do their jobs by supporting them, praying for them, and encouraging them. What have you done lately for the Moses in your life? Sometimes God also deepens our faith. Why? Because if everything is too convenient for us, if everything is too easy for us, then maybe we, our faith is not being tested. If, if all we do is just to hide behind the cloak that, um, that, uh, that we are actually Christians but without a voice, then maybe we are not bold enough. We don't have the courage to be able to speak God's truth in a fallen world, an unbelieving world. Friends, He allows for us God allows for us to experience divine detours in our lives 
because he wants to deepen our faith in him. And just like Moses, how he himself, his own faith was deepened by his relationship and encounter with God. First in the bush, the burning bush, and then now experiencing firsthand his miraculous works, the parting of the Red Sea before him, and the destruction of the Egyptian army behind them. They see, they've seen God's power at work. I encourage you, friends, today to allow God to use the detours in your life so that you may deepen your faith in Him, so that His glory, your, the, God, the glory of God, may be shown in all the world. Let's pray. Dear God, our Heavenly Father, help us, Lord, today to um, just completely trust You, to continue to meditate on Your words, to continue, Lord, to allow You to use us during these um, uncertain times. Whenever we feel stuck, allow us, Lord, to experience your love, your embrace. And help us, Lord, to face uh, our fears with the faith that you have given us. We love you. Just want to say that today. In Jesus' name, amen.